All right, I'm going to speak briefly. I'm a political scientist by training. I teach in international development studies here. I'm going to sp speak briefly about a growing movement that is sort of calling into question some of our traditional assumptions around the relationship between organized labor and environmental movements. So, um, the traditional view, of course, is one that we're probably all familiar with, is that there's a kind of inherent contradiction between those two groups. On the one hand, labor needs jobs. And that can be all kinds of imagery that comes to our mind. It can be uh, a worker in the Alberta oil patch. It can be someone in the auto industry. It can be a faraway vision of, uh, of a worker in Bangladesh working in a sweatshop producing cheap toys that then get shipped halfway around the world to markets here. People need those jobs. And it's often been seen that the labor movement for that reason has a kind of uh, inherent contradiction with the environmental movement. The environmental movement obviously would ideally want things like slower growth or at least steady growth, reducing fossil fuel consumption, which of course is not really compatible with shipping t-shirts all the way across the world, um, and really reducing consumption in general. I mean, that's not as talked about today as it once was, but that used to be a, a pillar of the environmental movement was reducing our consumption as opposed to making it more environmentally sustainable. So in recent years, there's all kinds of new movements afoot that I actually think are pretty exciting that have called this into question. And I sort of struggled between telling you about some of the movements or telling you a bit about Andreas Mann. And I decided to tell you about Andreas Mann instead because I figured you guys are already getting a dose of green jobs, which we, we just heard about, and other new green movements. So I find Mann is a particularly fascinating guy. He's a, a lecturer in human ecology at Lund University in Sweden. And he's one of many of these thinkers that is challenging the way we think of, th of the relationship between labor and the environment. And particularly around our use of fossil fuels. So I'm going to give you a snapshot of a few of the kind of things that he's raised. He's not the only person raising these questions that are feeding into rethinking the way we see this relationship. One of them is he's challenged a lot of our assumptions about the Industrial Revolution and the rise of the steam engine in 19th century Britain. It's typically assumed that this happened out of rationality out of science, sort of the inherent forward march of rational science being applied to technology. But in his historical work, he points out, look, um, steam power was mobile. Using traditional mills meant that the factory owners were connected to the water source. That actually empowered labor because there wasn't many workers in those rural communities. Uh, the owners of capital had to come up with ways to be more mobile. And that is a lot of the reason behind the driving force from water power to steam power. It's not the only reason. Basically, the transition to steam power from mills empowered capital against labor, he argues. Very convincingly, I would argue. He's got a great book out. Now, connected to this, he then uses this kind of argument to spill into all kinds of other ways we rethink ourselves in the environment. For example, did we as a global society choose a fossil fuel economy? Well, he points out that we might say that now, but it's actually historically inaccurate. The original decisions to turn towards steam, say in the cotton industry, were the same people that were making the decisions toward, to turn towards slavery in the cotton industry. It was a very tiny group of British elite in the 19th century, very powerful group, that made these decisions. The species, as Mom points out, did not vote for a fossil fuel-based economy. We were never actually consulted. These happened in ways beyond our control. So then Mom starts to apply these things to contemporary examples. He looks in Sweden, he looks at the closing down of Saab factories in Sweden and opening up in China. And he says, did this happen for society? Well, why did this happen? Well, because there's cheaper labor to exploit in China, so greater profits for capital. Who pays for the environmental cost of shipping cars all the way from China to Sweden? The other reason they go to China is for more, less stringent environmental laws. They can produce more emissions there. Yes. Yes. Um, and finally, he uses his, his uh, culmination of ideas to challenge the Anthropocene. The anthropo Anthropocene narrative is very powerful. It says human beings are responsible for climate change. But he says the problem with that is that we often accept that the society we live in today has been chosen by human beings, as opposed to a political system that's chosen by very different political and strategic interests. In particular, he points to the fact that there's a lot of contradictions in our world that aren't contradictions. Mass production and the environment, for example. He says, mass production can be turned towards producing public transit, solar panels, all the things we're familiar with. 
why is society so slow in making these transitions? He says, it's not because of us as a society, but it's because of the politics behind the decisions that we make. So I'm, I'm gonna, I focused on Mom, and here are some movements you guys might check it on your, on your own. But basically, thinkers like Mom are really challenging us to rethink the idea that there's a conflict between labor and environmental movements, and challenging us instead to see that you can bring social justice and environmental justice together um, in, in a more robust way if you start to look at our society more politically and not look at the decisions we make around fossil fuel consumptions as just being ones that we've all made together. 